Hey, is your business stuck in founder-led sales? Join me on this episode of po Profit with a Plan podcast with my guest, Corey Quinn, best-selling author and former CMO of Scorpion, where he took his revenue from $20 million to $150 million in just six years. Corey shares his game-changing strategy behind deep specialization and why it's key to scaling your business. We're going to dive into how to choose the right vertical market that can transform your clients' results, your results, and turn your team into true experts and even increase your pricing power. So why is it so tough for business owners to step back from sales and how to focus on the niche that makes all the difference? So you don't want to miss Corey's insight on escaping the founder trap and scaling the new heights. Tune in for today's practical takeaways and fresh perspectives on growth. Hey, entrepreneurs, are you trying to boost your profits and grow your business? Welcome to Profit with the Plan, where we share strategies to help you scale your company, increase profitability, and set up for a future exit. I'm your host, Marcia Reiner, business growth strategist and the profit booster behind Infinite Profit. I've helped countless entrepreneurs to build highly scalable and profitable sale-ready businesses, uh, which means more power or more profits now and bigger payouts later. My mouth doesn't want to work this afternoon. <laughs> Today's episode is also sponsored by Infinite Profit, where we don't just talk profit, we deliver it. And if you're ready to take your business to the next level, visit InfiniteProfitConsulting.com and start your boosting your bottom line today. Hey, but before we get started, I've got really something special for you. And I thought, you know, if you ever want to do avoid those profit plateaus, operational headaches, and those pesky growth roadblocks, go grab my free Profit Booster Playbook at BoostingProfit.com. That's where I share three essential strategies to elevate your profits quickly. All right, let's jump into today's episode. Enough with the commercials. Our guest today is Corey Quinn. Corey has 17 years of agency experience, including his stint as Scorpion CMO, where he helped grow revenue from 20 million to 150 million in just six years. That's a wow, listeners. Uh, <laughs> he's just published his best selling book. Anyone, not everyone, a proven system for agencies to escape the founder led sales. Today, he helps digital agency founders scale their revenue and profits with deep specialization. You have a feeling what we're going to talk about today? Specialization. Mm -hmm. Welcome, Corey, to Profit with a Plan podcast. I'm so excited to have you on today. Marcia, I am so excited to be here. You know, this has been so fun for me to meet these experts like yourself that have these the, these niches that really, mm -hmm. you know, most of us other business owners, we're just, you know, throwing spaghetti on the wall, hoping it sticks, chasing customers, putting out fire. And to have an expert like you come on and really define what specialization is and see the results on the other side Ooh, that just really, I mean, it, yeah. it definitely excites me and I hope the audience gets excited by it as well. But yeah. let me ask you a quick question though. How did you get into marketing and specialization? What was that, what was that shift for you? Great, great question. Well, I started my career in marketing and advertising very, very young. In fact, I starred in the world's first Chicken McNuggets commercial ever, aired, out of here. everywhere, anywhere. Yes, I was the I was a child actor. At seven years old here in Los Angeles in Hollywood, down the street from me, nice. uh, I was recruited to uh, you know, become an actor. And I actually, I did that for a couple of years, was on a bunch of national uh, commercials, big brands. I did Igloo Ice Chest, a bunch of McDonald's, a uh, bunch of stuff. And so I got my start pretty early in, in the advertising world. Luckily, I decided, I think luckily, I think I decided to go back to being a normal kid and stop stop acting. And so I I left that world behind, and then ever since I left college, I've been in the you know the broadcast media marketing space. But when it comes to my agency uh, experience, for those folks who have an agency background or uh, work at an agency, uh, I've been in the agency space as you mentioned for over seventeen years. Uh, I started off in sales. I love sales. We do what they call. Oh no, you're not one of them. Wait a minute. Ooh, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> 
I am. I don't know if one of them. I'm not sure exactly. I'm just teasing. Yeah, but I will share with you that I started off doing consult in the agency space, <clears throat> selling PPC and SEO, all these uh, marketing terms, online marketing terms, to large brands such as Lululemon and Remax and Hyundai and all these great things. Loved sales. Made my way up into the sales through the sales channel. Eventually became a sales manager, and then, as you mentioned. Most recently, I was the chief marketing officer of this amazing little agency that I joined in 2015, and we were able to grow revenue eight times in six short years. It was bananas. I was not as gray as I am now. Uh, when I started, it was a lot of highs, a lot of lows, a lot of late nights. It was amazing. I would never, uh, I would never replace it with anything. It was a really wonderful time. And then since I left a couple of years ago, I decided to take all the wonderful insights and learnings, both from that that uh, experience as a chief marketing officer, as well as my entire career, and uh, pour into a book, which is really a five-step process to go from what I call a generalist, uh, someone who serves businesses of all shapes and sizes, into a what I call a vertical market specialist using deep specialization. And by the way, for the listeners, this isn't just for agencies. This is for service-based businesses. This is for product-based businesses. This is for SaaS businesses. This works for any type of business. You know what? You know what the 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 connector that I think um I hear in all of this is that you grew up as a, you know, you, well, you started in, in front of the camera, but then you went into sales and then you went into yeah. marketing. Yes. And I think that those are all have always been two separate departments. Marketing says we're going to generate the lead. And then sales says, I got to close the lead based on the marketing yeah. and what the company works. And, and oftentimes they're, they're butting heads because they're not right. talking the same thing. And mm -hmm. what your background tells me is that you're able to marry the two and have the, have it be seamless through the transaction. And, you know, better salesmen know how to sell when they know what the marketing pitch was and the buyer started to hear to open the door. And it's absolutely like you nailed that. There's nothing worse for a salesperson than uh, being handed a lead who was, uh, who came in on some kind of, uh, offer or guarantee that the salesperson has no idea like what what's going on. So exactly, I, I agree. The way I define marketing is is taking sales, which is a one on one uh, conversation, to a one to many. Mm, right? You're just marketing. Interesting. You're doing sales on a on a one to many basis. And I, so I you're coming that. from the sales first into marketing rather um, than marketing uh, first into sales. It, it, exactly, and the way that I it's so interesting because it's, it's very true about my sort of my approach and my philosophy about how to do this, which is very sort of buyer centric or vertical market centric. You start with the buyer and then you begin to understand the key pain points and the, the key attributes, what they care about. And then you build a marketing strategy based on that. That's where you start is the buyer. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Love yeah. it. And, and it works better, right? You get yeah. better conversions and, right. and, and profits and numbers and everything behind it that comes from it. And, um, you know, I think that's the biggest problem that, that people do is they go out and they start a business and they say, okay, I got this thing and I'm going to do this thing and I'm going to sell this thing. Now oh, yeah. I got to find buyers to buy my thing rather yeah. than going, oh, the buyers have a problem and I think yeah. I could solve that problem for yeah. them, which is me, polar opposite. Yeah. Let me tell you an example. Um, a friend of mine, he was on my podcast, interviewed him. His name is Alex and he very similarly started a business, a, a web design business a long time ago now. And, you know, it was one of these things where he just didn't want to have a job. He wanted to be an entrepreneur. So what did he do? He just started a web design company, very ambitious guy. And of course he, he, he let all of his, his college friends know, his high school friends know, his neighborhood, you know, the neighborhood kids know. And of course, he started building websites for everybody. He built websites for the local furniture store. He built one for the local ice cream truck guy. And it was great. Like he had revenue and he started hiring employees until he realized that he was building websites for all these different types of businesses, eventually started selling some uh, marketing stuff. And he realized that he had built a business completely customized. Every mm. client had a different product, a different process. And of course, his 
his clients or sorry, his, his team started resenting every new client that got brought in because it was, they had to relearn a whole new business line. In fact, he told me the frustration he scratch. felt. The problem that, yeah, exactly. The the thing that he felt was that he was going into a, another sales meeting, one after the other, because of course it was founder led because he had to close the deal. He knew what to promise and whatnot. And he would scratch his head and saying, okay, what is this business again? Do they want patients? Do they want clients? Do they want, um, you know, foot traffic, right? And he realized that he had built this monster of a business that had no ability to really be systematized and process driven. Therefore it was completely mm. dependent on him. Oh, dang. Isn't that a problem? Listen Isn't to that, that business problem? owners. You are the business, right? That's terrible. This is, this That's is a terrible place this. to be in. There, there is a silver lining. It was at that moment when he realized, hey, I need, to, I need to specialize. And he went through a process where he ultimately decided to specialize in medical practices because he wanted to work for businesses that made a bigger impact in the world. Mm. And as a result of doing that specialization, he focused his business and just started focusing again on medical practices and went to the conferences and you know wrote wrote blog posts about that and so on and so forth. As a result of that focus, he built he now has a very profitable eight-figure agency that is dominating in the market. He has the freedom that he wants, he has the income he wants. Uh, he has built a business that frankly a lot of investors would love to buy, but that he doesn't want to sell. Yeah. And it's easy to systematize and mm. that he's not involved in, in, as I say, swinging the hammer every day. He yeah, sits back absolutely. and leads the team because the lead, the team has a process to follow all the time. That's right. And that's, mm. and that is a really big value proposition that is sort of inherent in the vertical specialization in that if you solve the same problem for the same audience over and over and over and over again, a lot of things become much easier. You get better at what you do. Um, you, you're able to remove yourself as a founder because you, if you are selling to specifically in the sales context, if you're selling the same product to the same person, you don't need the founder to, to do that sale. In fact, when I arrived at Scorpion in 2015, I remember going into the sales floor and listening to some of the sales calls. And what I learned was Scorpion, by the way, for context, they were focused on attorneys. Mm. Okay. I learned was good name attorney, for attorneys, right? The Scorpion. Yeah, deal. right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Aggressive marketing. It worked perfectly. And so these, these attorneys would call into Scorpion, call into the sales floor. And what I didn't hear, which was interesting was, well, who is the founder? Can I talk to the founder? You know, what's up with the story? What's the story behind the founder? They didn't talk about the founder at all. It was never a part of the conversation ever it was not a part of their buying criteria. What they cared about is, do you understand the problem that I have? Have you solved it for others? And can you solve it for me? Mm. And as a result of that specialization, they were able to do a magical thing called a one call close, right? Wow. Call close for, you know, big, big money, right? And so that was when that opened my eyes to the power of specialization in a business's ability to begin to streamline and separate from that sort of that founder-led sales motion. Well, you know what the other thing is, is that you you mentioned it just kind of as an afterthought that this this um this guy has this business that somebody wants to buy really bad and he doesn't yeah. want to sell it. That's right. because it's a perfectly run company that the owner doesn't have to go along with the business to make the business run. And right. that's There's why no it's so rest. attractive. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, if you, if you were an investor coming in to buy a business and, oh, by the way, everything is run through the founder or, you know, if you want, if, if you need to get new revenue, it has to you know deal with the founder. You're probably not going to be too excited to buy that company because if you incentivize the, the founder to take their money and ride off in the sunset, what have you really bought? Right. A bunch of employees and bought a headache, you know, <laughs> bought a headache right? You have to figure out how to take what they have and make it more systematized and make it more streamlined. Exactly. I love it. Okay. So here's the, here's the biggest question that's ringing oh. in my ears. And I'm sure all the audience is listening is having the same thought, right? <laughs> but if I pick one, yeah, then I'm going to miss out on the others. Oh, it's so true. Well, here's the, here's the interesting dynamic is that most people are like 
Alex, the one I mentioned, who is the business owner who gets into business, puts out the word and says yes to everybody. That is the common way that people get into business, especially in a service-based business, right? CPAs, mm -hmm, exactly. attorneys, all those things. All of that is great. And I'm actually a fan of doing it that way. The challenge is you'll reach a certain level, typically you reach a certain level whereby the chaos in your business prevents you from continuing to grow, right? Exactly. And what happens in that spot is you'll typically have a founder who says, well, we just need to do more marketing or we need to hire more people or whatever. And more. then that just fails, right, more. That, that, that of course, fails because it doesn't resolve the issue of the chaos in, in the based in the you know, having too many different, different types of businesses. It's only until they realize, okay, the specialization thing, I have to, I have to do something about it. I have to start saying no to all these different people. I have to figure out who to say yes to. Mm -hmm. And it only comes in my experience, that only becomes a choice that's actually physically on the table when they've banged their head against the wall too many times to realize that there's no other real way to get there. That's my experience. Um, Love it. But I think the thing emotionally that gets them over the the hump from uh, resistant to specializing to really bought in is actually doing the numbers. I'm going to give you some, we'll do some quick math here together. Cool. Okay. Let me get out my calculator. <laughs> I couldn't do this by, by in my head. So let's see if the audience will, will walk, walk along with us. So let me ask you, Marcia, how many, just take a wild guess, how many residential plumbing businesses are there in the United States today? Oh my gosh. A couple hundred thousand. Yeah. So the number is based on my re current research, it is 157,000 residentially focused plumbing businesses. Wow. And so the context here is, let's just say we focused our business. We, instead of working with any type of business, we said, we want to go after plumbers. We really, we, we, we see it. Um, you know, an opportunity there. We like working with them. Maybe you have some evidence of working with them. If you were able through focusing to get 1%, just one little sliver of that entire market, you'd have 1,570 plumbing clients, which is a lot of clients. Yeah. And you, let's say for argument's sake that you spent, they, they spent $10,000 an entire year with you. Okay. I mean, each year, you'd have, each year, right. Recurring. That means that you'd have a $15.7 million business. 1%, $10,000, solving the same problem for the same type of client over and over and over again. So what have you built? A very highly repeatable process, a business that has great retention because you're specialized, you're really good at it because you've had a lot of reps and you're, you have great profitability because you don't have to hire very expensive people to run the business. In fact, because it's so process driven, you're able to use a lot of software to run the and business. And that's only 1%. That's only 1% of the possibility yes. out there, which <laughs> what if you did great and you doubled your practice and you had right. 2%. Right. I exactly. mean, that's huge. Right. Right. And so that's so, the kind so of- So is the trick to find a big yeah. enough market or mm -hmm. is the trick to find a specialized skill? Good question. So- you can think of it in one of one of a couple of ways. So some ways, there's two real ways that people specialize their business. So I'm going to generalize here for a minute. Sure. You could specialize in what you do, right? I'm a CPA. I work with businesses and I just do the CPA work. That's a specialization in what you do. Uh, let's say it on the horizontal axis. You could also be on a, on a vertical axis if you think of like an XY axis. I work only with, um, uh, let's say, entrepreneurs, right? And so that's what I do. I, I solve problems for entrepreneurs. That's who I help. Where you get the magic is where you say, I specialize in being a CPA for entrepreneurs. Ah, right. That's it. where you're able to be very, very clear in the marketplace. Like, oh, I'm, I need a CPA. And I'm an entrepreneur. Typically, that's where you get the uh, Rolodex moment. Oh, I know a guy at CPA who specializes in entrepreneurs. Let me put you in touch type of thing, right? So that's more I of a, a positioning, positioning uh, exercise. The um, the magic, I think, is when you are focusing in on a vertical market first, because here's the thing, when you become expert at solving a type of problem, a growth problem or an accounting problem for a vertical market, the tools may come and go. For example, I don't know if you remember this, but a couple of years ago, there was a website called Vine. It's like TikTok today. 
I don't but remember Vine. I mean, I'm old enough to remember Vine, but I don't remember Vine. It's okay. It's okay. It was kind of niche but it was, if you think about it, you're familiar with TikTok, right? Yeah. yeah. Everyone knows TikTok, right? So um, it was an early version of, of uh, TikTok. It was owned by Twitter. In any event, really short, fun uh, videos, right? 30 second videos, whatever. Or I think it was 10 second videos. It was great. It was a great platform. Well, what happens if you're a, a business that says, I only work, I, I work on this platform. I, my position is I am a Vine marketing agency. What happens when Vine goes away? Your business goes away. You have to start from scratch, right? Yes, I and only so sell VHS cartridges and my company's right. named Blockbuster, right? right. Or um, I only sell cameras and film and my company is Kodak. Right. Exactly. So when you become attached to or you tie your business's future to a platform or a software, uh, even SEO, I mean, who knows what the future is with um, with AI and how that's going to change you know, consumer behaviors. So, which is why I'm a fan, generally speaking, I don't have a problem with SEO firms or anything. I, I have a lot of great friends who run them, but my, my, my advice or my preference was if I was to give advice to my son, who's only 10 years old, so he's not he's not ready for this advice, is to focus on solving problems for a specific vertical market because the tools will come and go. What the clients yeah. are hiring you for is your specialization solving problems for them. Mm. So in the only way you're really going to get well-known and good at it is to continuously solve that same type of problem. Correct. Right. Regardless so think of about think about the law space, right? I know mm. tons of lawyers. <clears throat> they all tend, the good ones tend to specialize in a certain lane of law. Law is yeah. huge, but they yeah. happen to be estate attorneys, Correct. injury so attorneys, injury. right? Yeah. I mean, because Formal they defense. know that space so yes. well yep. that they can solve the person's problems exactly. because they know it really well. Right. It goes back to the old saying, like, if you're going to have brain surgery, you don't want your general practitioner to to go in with the scalpel, right? You want the best in the world. The person who only does that. In fact, I did have surgery, uh, interestingly, uh, pretty invasive surgery. And the surgeon who I luckily went with, uh, he is the best in the world at, um, at doing this particular type of surgery. And I was warned that he has very poor bedside manner. Oh, and no. I I don't care if he's the biggest jerk on the planet. As long as he's the best at doing this surgery, I'm good with it, right? <laughs> he comes in with Coke bottle glasses and shaky yeah. hands going up so right. on your brain. <laughs> well, I don't care if he's got that reputation, right? And I think that that's the interesting thing about a vertical market is that when you target a vertical market, you do great work. It's like every vertical is like a village, right? Mm. It's, it's, it's relatively small. Everyone kind of knows everyone else. Everyone's like one degree of separation. And when you do great work and you repetitively in a vertical market, word spreads, you have this wonderful word of mouth and you get wonderful referrals. There's this thing in business called the, um, the, the day one list. Have you heard of this? The day no. one list? No. So Harvard business, Harvard business review did a, did a, an article and a research project around researching how businesses buy. What they found is that 80 to 90% of businesses have a day one list, which is they have a short list of businesses who they're going to interview to see who to hire for the, you know, for the project. If you think okay. about, for instance, if you were going to go and buy a car, you're probably not going to go test drive 40 different cars. You probably today have an idea of a, maybe a small handful of cars that you would test drive before you sure. made the purchase. You may already know what car you want, right? Same thing is true in the business context. Businesses have a short list of options that they want to interview and they want to look at. So the challenge for any business is how do I get on that short list? Ooh. Two, right? I, I like get? that. <laughs> There's two ways to get on the day one list. Oh, and by the way, 90% of the uh, businesses buy or hire a company on the short, on the day one list. So right. it is a very valuable list to be on. That's huge <laughs> to, to think of it that way. And, you know, I mean, when you think about your buyer's journey and where they're going, they're doing all the pre-research. They're, yeah. they're, they're prepared when they put their RFP out, yeah, you know, exactly. to, 
to interview and they're they're going after their short list. And if you're That's lucky right. to be on, you've already checked off a lot of boxes. They're just kind of going through the the motion of do they like you or not, right? Right. Right. Yeah. Ooh, exactly. I like that. Okay. So there's two ways. There's two ways to get on the uh, the day one list. They've worked with you before, or they've been re- or you've been referred to them by someone else who they trust. Pretty powerful. That's pretty powerful. And if you haven't <laughs> worked with them before and someone hasn't referred them, then you're probably a pretty shiny, sparkly unicorn that's just popped up on the on their mm. radar. But I mean, right. they have to have already heard about you. Correct. To wow. consider you. So the, the way to be referred is to leverage this social networks that exist within a vertical market, do great work, and make sure that people are talking about you. And mm-hmm. the beauty, again, of these vertical markets is they have these natural um, places where people congregate, right? You go to the annual conferences, you go to the associations, you have online uh, forums. My wife is a psychiatrist, okay? Guess where she spends her free time? On the psychiatry, the mom's psychiatry network on Facebook. It's like a private group. Wow. Right? They all talk about psychiatry things and being a mom and so on and so forth. So- these na- these these networks are natural. They're naturally occurring. People congregate around their own vertical market. And that's what you want to infiltrate as a vertical specialist. Mm. Wow. This we didn't even get into the juicy stuff here of how do you do all of that? Because I know, I know that's what's burning on people's mind. But looking at yes. the clock, I'm thinking, okay, we got about five minutes left here. Okay. So you gave us you gave us a really juicy thing. First of all, I mean. I don't even know if I want to waste my time in saying, how do we choose a vertical market? You know, how do we, there's, there's a dozen questions here. So um, if we're coming in and we've already chosen our vertical market, we decide that we're going to go with your plumbers example and go for that 1%. Love it. And, and we're going there and we take the step and do what your, what your wife is, is we get on their, their association and Mm -hmm. we, um, we we get into the Facebook group of of plumbers, yeah. right? Then how do we start to really infiltrate and get our name yes. out as the expert? That's such a good question. So um, I'll be brief, but there are three three legs to the stool when it comes to uh, how to go to market, how to build your practice, how to build your business full of this vertical market. There's inbound, outbound, and relationship based marketing. Inbound really easily or really quickly is a little bit different than how HubSpot defines uh, inbound for us marketers. It's effectively, if I'm a buyer, where am I going to research different options to put onto my, 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 my day one list? Okay. So it's probably paid search, doing content marketing, starting a podcast, like all of those great things. Make sure you're, you're findable when your target audience is in the process of buying. Okay. But, so you pop up on search when they're searching for you. Exactly. The challenge of course, is that Inbound, that's, you know, typically inbounds, only 3% of any market is going inbound in any quarter. Tiny little fraction of the people you want to serve. Are and there's actually... a lot of people out there that are trying and to pop their head options. up and looking, right? Exactly. Which is why outbound has to be a part of your strategy. So outbound is very, can be very difficult. I've uh, spent very expensive, long, long, very expensive. We actually cracked the code at Scorpion. We did something that's called gift-based outbound. Ooh, okay. Yeah. What it does is it will transform the out the cold outreach from frigid cold to warm. And here's here's why. You send a thoughtful gift ahead of the cold call directly to the the, the VIP person that you're trying to influence. You send Ooh. them things like gourmet cookies. You send them things like a video brochure or maybe a book that you wrote, something that is thoughtful and makes them feel like a VIP. Can't be any, you know, cheap logo swag or whatnot. It has to right. be something that, that is thoughtful. It's unique. It's striking. It leaves a great impression. When you call on those, you get a much different dynamic from the typical cold call. Nice. Okay. I like that idea. Another use for your book, right? Exactly. In fact, I've got uh, a book, a box <laughs> with my book and a bunch of cookies going out to a bunch of agencies this week. So nice. Uh, I like it. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. And, okay. So, so 
Yeah. You know, that's the old, that's the old, uh, you know, I mean, I used to do that in financial services. I would, exactly. I would during tax season, hit up a bunch of CPAs and, and bring them tax survival kits. Right. Exactly. Um, Perfect. So yeah, really good idea. Okay. So mm -hmm. that's, that's one way you've cracked the code, right? Cracked the code. And then, so that's the only way we do um, outbound is gift based. Send a gift first and you don't just send one gift. 90% 90, 90 of the, com the companies you send a gift to are probably going to ghost you. 10% will actually meet with you, but 90% and you send them another gift in 90 days and then another gift in 90 days and then another gift. You keep sending gifts for up to three years. It's a whole, there's wow. a whole strategy. So that, that's a long out. sales cycle a, to get the, to sales. get more numbers, right? But right. exponentially, you're only getting the first 10% or an opportunity at the first 10%. Correct. But exponentially, right. if you send a second gift, you might get the next 12 or 13 or 15%. Exactly, exactly. And it just, it builds. Mm -hmm. So you you get that. And then the third, the third leg to the stool is relationship-based marketing. People want to buy belly to belly, let's call it, right? They want to actually see you and they want to go out and have a cocktail with you. They want to have an experience with you. And that's why vertical, uh, taking a vertical marketing approach is really powerful in that regard because you know which conferences to go to, you know which events to 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 host and to spend time at, and gosh, it really underlines this idea behind deep specialization, which is that you really have to like the people that you're serving <laughs> because guess what, you're gonna be spending a lot of time with them. <laughs> yeah. So if you go find that plumber, you know when they bend over and they show you their tail end, and right. you know, or you might not like the conversations that go on in plumber right. conventions. It, it might not be not the be area for you. <laughs> right. Exactly, and that's important because the real the real way to do this is not to be stuck behind your keyboard trying to send, you know, spammy email. It's going out and having a, building a genuine relationship with the actual people in the market. I think the other part of that third leg, though, that really peaked for me. Yeah. was when you had that Rolodex moment yes, and you were able to go, oh, you know, anybody could connect the dots by giving you that referral by saying, oh, I know a guy that does Correct. just that. Correct. You know, I know yeah. a gal that does just that. And, and the only way you could do that is by making sure the people around you know that you serve one client and you're, you do, and you do that, Right. You know, oh, you're an ex that better. you're an attorney that serves um, injury accidents for yeah. ladies that get hit by Uber. I don't know. That's exactly um, right. No, you're you're exactly right, Marcia. I think there's one more aspect I'll throw in here that I think is yeah. interesting is, you know, you have golden eggs, and you have a you have, then you have the goose that go, lays the golden eggs, right? Yeah. And so <laughs> the golden egg, of course, is the client, right? It's the, it's the it's the wonderful relationship you build with them, but within a vertical market, there are the goose that lays the golden eggs for you in any social network, especially in, in vertical markets, there are what Malcolm Gladwell, Gladwell called mavens and mavens are people who have just a lot of social capital in the, in the industry. Everyone looks to them, see what are they doing? Who do they like? So on and so forth. That's the person that you want to have on your team mm. talking about because everyone's going to them asking about who should they work with. Mm. That's powerful. Mm. Oh my gosh, Corey, we could talk on this for days. This is yeah. so good. And yeah. I know that there's still listeners sitting back there going, but yeah, if I only go with them, then I'm going to miss out on everybody else. And, mm -hmm. and I think it's, you know, they're, you, bigger bat maybe maybe a heavier book to hit them over the head with. I, I don't, um, I don't, I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what my approach is. They're not ready yet. Yes, I agree. Not ready. They'll but be yeah, ready. You know that phrase, the yeah. riches are in the niches, right? It's true. It's true. And I think the, the, it feels good to say that, but it's once you say, okay, I want a niche. Okay. It's scary as hell. But then what? Exactly. That's why this book that I wrote is, uh, is a guide for folks who say, okay, I want a niche down and I want it, but I need a plan. I need to know what to do. That's why I wrote yeah, it. Yeah. Cause I mean, that's, that's the big thing. That's the million dollar question. Okay, I'm going to take the step of faith. I'm going to step out over the ledge and say, mm -hmm. okay, now what do I do? My whole business model in my mind is now going to change, mm -hmm. which is perfect for this time of year, right? <laughs> exactly. um, and, to, and to have it change, but to go, now what? 
How do I do that? Where do I go? So tell us more about your book. Where can listeners find out more about you and get access to your book? Beautiful. Well, Marcia, I have a special offer for just your listeners. They can go to anyonenoteveryone.com, download the audiobook, the audible version, the audio book of my book, the entire book right now. It also, you'll also get an amazing workbook that has worksheets and videos and checklists and all these, all these great resources by going again to anyone, not everyone.com start downloading it, start listening to it right now, get access to the five steps, all the wisdom that we, uh, we put in the, the book. It's all available for everyone right now. Awesome. That's cool. Well, you know what? I'm definitely going after it because I'm one of those ones that go, yeah, I niche. And then I always seem to, you know, I always seem to go in and then widen out and then go in and then widen out. I I know. I know. It's one of those. I'm, you know, it's, we we have to. You're normal, right? I mean, it's like, we're all human, right? Nobody's ever said I was normal. Thank you. That was was very kind. No, I'm kidding. But yeah, it is, it's scary, but I think that's really where you're going to get that expert status. You're going to have people be able to refer you because you specialize in in one space. And, you know, when you get into a community of doctors, they're going to go, oh, hey, uh, this gal Marcia helped me. This, this guy, Corey helped me. Oh, really? Who was that? You know, and they talk. So great opportunities come when you do that. I think that's it. Awesome. Awesome. Wow. Listeners, thanks for tuning in today. I hope you picked up some valuable insight and some actionable ideas that can help you make your business more profitable. And I know Corey's book is going to really move the needle for you. If you're ready and you're sitting on the fence going, you know, those last five people I worked with, customers I worked with, they were all five different people. And I'd rather just have a process to be able to work with one kind of client. You know, that doesn't mean you can never work with the people on the outside, but you can choose to work with the people on the outside of that circle. And you can get a whole lot more specific working mm-hmm. with the people inside that space. So I love it. I'm definitely going to take a Take a, a go get the audio version of his book and start reading away, listening away. Please, please do. Yeah. And as I mentioned, talking about um, books, I've got a profit booster playbook that you can go grab for free if you're interested in taking your business to the next level. You can go get that at boostingprofit.com, where I break down the steps to drive profit, uh, streamline your operation, and prepare your business for future growth and that ultimate sale. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. We don't want to miss any future episodes of Profit with Your Plan, Profit with a Plan, and you can find us on any of the podcast platforms. We're looking forward to more great profitable information on next week's show. So until then, make your plans and profit with them. Thank you so much, Corey. Thank you. Marcia.